the, the tenets of social justice. We all need some healing every now and then. E even if we don't know what healing means, it doesn't mean cure. It, it doesn't mean cure. Healing for me is freedom. Freedom to be who you be, when you want to be, and where you want to be. So the process continues. So this, 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 the undergirding theme of this gathering is healing the families through social justice. And we are honoring the beginning of this conversation with what really, really happened. What really, really happened. And you know I'm talking about that so-called syphilis study. The thing they call the Tuskegee syphilis study. We, we know better now, and so we know better, we should do better. We don't, we don't say the Tuskegee syphilis study up in here. We just don't do it, because it's a, it's a misnomer. How it got there, why they used it, I'm not sure. And it really doesn't matter, but we don't use it here. But we forgive those who use it, because they just don't know better. So we allow them to learn as we continue the process. Our first session this morning is really about that process. And can we have the, uh, the keynoters and, and the uh, um, responders get ready? Uh, because now it's time to hear from you. And for the last couple of years, we've decided that uh, our, our students, uh, which really are the champions of today and, and tomorrow, um, are needed a more engaging role in, in this process. So last year, we turned over the moderation to the students. And they did a, a wonderful, wonderful job. And that came under the leadership of, of the person who actually uh, organizes and, and coordinates and directs the public ethics intensive. And I, I'm, I'm going to ask her to come, to come forward. Dr. Wyland Wilson. And I do that because, you know, there are a few of us who are in the, in the, in the, the public domain. We're in the public's eye. But uh, I I'm, I'm, don't hesitate to let er everybody know who's doing the work. So I want the public to thank Dr. Wilson. And she really has, has done, done the work. And the moderator for our, our first session, a, a student who I met earlier in the year, Diamond Frazier, and, and I, I met her because she uh, told me that she wanted to be a physician, OBGYN. And she said it in a way that it made it real clear that she's going to be a physician. Um, and so it, it's no doubt about that. Um, and I also, uh, I finished Meharry Medical College. And so without hesitation, I told her that that's that the best place in the world to go to medical school or a dental school, I'm a dentist. Uh, because it, it, it took us, uh, as I say, a soul like me. And, and four years later, I, well, I was a dentist. I didn't know what happened. <laughs> but if, if, if they could do it with me, I'm convinced they can do it with anybody. <laughs> So I've been very particular and, and very uh, thoughtful about sending students to Mahan. And so um, I, I'm sending Diamond to Mahan. So anybody wants to go to Harvard or Yale or anywhere else, she's going to Mahan. <laughs> <laughs> and I think she's made that clear to y'all. I'm not trying to convince her, she's convinced me. So I wanted to come forth and, and start the, the, uh, this first session. And so let's welcome her to the podium. Good morning. Diamond Frazier, a sophomore majoring in biology pre-med, and I will be your mediator for the RIB Institutional Review Board in Syphilis Study. I am a member in the Bioethics Honors Program and also minor in Bioethics. Thank you for attending our session today. 
It is my pleasure to welcome you. The keynote speaker for this session is Dr. Often Kaplan, and the respondents are Dr. Ralph Katz and Dr. John Harrell. Dr. Often Kaplan, currently the Dr. William F. and Virginia Conley Midi Professor and founding head of the Division of Bioethics at New York University, Lagone Medical Center in New York City. He is the co-founder and the dean Dean of Research of the NYU Sports and Society Program and the head of the ECNIS program in the Global Institute for Public Health at NYU. Prior to, come, prior to coming to NYU, he was the Sidney D. Kaplan Professor of Bioethics at the University of Pennsylvania Parliament School of Medicine in Philadelphia, where he created the Center for Bioethics in the Department of Medical Ethics. Dr. Kaplan has also taught at the University of Minnesota where he founded the Center for Biomedical Ethnics, the University of Pittsburgh, and Columbia University. He received his PhD from Columbia University. Dr. Kaplan is the author or editor of 32 books and over 600 papers in peer-reviewed journals. He is, his most recent books is Replacement Parts, The Ethnics of Procuring and Replacing Organs in Humans. <laughs> Dr. Kaplan is a regular common commentator on bioethics and healthcare issues for WebMD, Medscape, for WGBH Radio in Boston, and WMFN Public Radio in Tampa. He appears frequently as a guest and commentator on various other national and international media outlets. Dr. Kaplan has served on a number of national and international committees, including as the chair, National Cancer Institute Biobanking Ethnics Working Group, the chair of the advisory committee of, to the United, the United Nations on Human Cloning, the chair of the advisory committee to the Department of Health and Human Service on Blood Safety and Availability, a member of the Presidential Advisory Committee on Gulf War Illnesses and numerous others. Please give a round of applause for Dr. Arthur Kaplan. The respondents. The first respondent is Dr. Ralph V. Katz. Dr. Katz recently spent the spring semester of 2015 on sabbatical leave from NYU as an in-resident scholar at the National Center for Bioethics and Research in Healthcare at Tuskegee University, working on a bioethics project at the center. Having served on the National Legacy Committee, which initiated a formal request for a presidential apology, he was an invitee to the White House by President Clinton for the May 1997 presidential apology for the U.S. Public Health Service Syphilis Study, known as the Tuskegee Syphilis Study. Dr. John Harrell. The Reverend Dr. John Harrell is an ordained clergywoman, public health communications an award-winning broadcast journalist and docu documentary producer. She is a graduate of the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism in New York City, recipient of the Sherman Postgraduate Fellow at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, and completed her doctoral work in public theology at the Chicago Theological Seminary. Dr. Hara is an Associate Director of the Community Engagement Corps and Visiting Scholar at the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University. She is also the Senior Associate Editor of the Journal of Healthcare, Science and Humanities and the originator and content developer of the National Bioethics Center Web 2.0, which includes National Bioethics Center's mobile app and the website for Tuskegee Mobile, Tuskegee mobile Bioethics Center. Now we will have Dr. Dr. Kaplan. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a real honor to uh, be here. I don't know whether I'm more excited to be at the school, the city, or the county, <laughs> but they all sound pretty nice. Um, and I apologize. I'm here today, but I've, I'm going to be leaving relatively quickly, so I can't really uh, get a chance to meet uh, as many folks here as I'd like to. I've got to go back up to New York University uh, today because we have a graduation coming, so uh, we've got some honors things I have to do up there uh, tomorrow morning, so I apologize for that. And I'll make a point to get back here and spend more money at McDonald's. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, here's a question for you. 
don't know, it's a trivia question. Who made the first apology about the Tuskegee uh, research, so to speak? The first public apology? Mm -hmm. First public apology. To my knowledge, it was Bill Clinton. Right, except it's wrong. I actually held a meeting, two meetings in a row, when I was at the University of Minnesota. The first one was the first meeting in the world ever on the legacy of experiments in the concentration camps uh, for research. And we got an apology there from the German Medical Association, 1989. I did that meeting because it was to honor my dad who, if any of you have ever seen those films of soldiers going into the Dachau concentration camp, they're coming through the gates in World War II, you can see my father. Uh, he's one of the soldiers going in. And for many, many years, he did not talk about what he saw there. Uh, he can't shut up about it now, but he didn't talk about it then for probably up until I got into college, I would say. Uh, he's still alive, he's 97. He will tell you he doesn't remember much about it, and then he'll tell you hour by hour what took place from 1942 to 1945. But um, it was a searing experience for him. He saw terrible things, and I decided in my career to pay attention to situations where people had been abused and exploited by uh, medicine, and that is what happened in the concentration camps. That led me to do another meeting, I think it was the first one held in the United States, again at the University of Minnesota on Tuskegee. We did it in 1991. Uh, it was an interesting meeting because it was in Minnesota, it was the largest assemblage of white people ever to see a discussion of Tuskegee, I think, um, but we did it. And Lewis Sullivan came. And Lewis Sullivan apologized for the Tuskegee study at that conference. It was really the first government official to do so. It didn't escape my notice. That was one of the first African-American officials uh, to be in service in the United States. And uh, there's a tape of it somewhere, but you can ask him. He's still here. Uh, and it was a very moving uh, Ex experience because it set in motion what became the later Clinton apology and then what became the Bioethics Institute that Ruben has so ably run for many, many years. So the interesting thing about history is you got to keep paying attention to it because you lose some of the uh, detail if you don't watch. And I've been waiting a long time to get here to sort of uh, let you know who the first uh, person was. And I think it's I'm very glad that Bill Clinton did what he did, but I'm even more proud that uh, the secretary of what was then uh, Health and Human Services did what he did, and it was actually an African-American man who had ascended to that important position who did it. Now, I've been thinking about what I wanted to talk about here, and uh, I'm going to actually go forward and not backward. I've said what I want to say about the history right now concerning research events about Tuskegee, but I want to tell you about a problem today, uh, an interesting ethical problem about access to health care that impacts people who are poor, uh, that poses challenges uh, to access to care, and raises some really tough ethics problems, and I've been working on this uh, for the past year and a half now with a gigantic company, Johnson & Johnson. Some of you know them because you might see their baby powder, but they actually make a lot of drugs, they make a lot of devices, they're a very big pharmaceutical company, and the pharmaceutical division of that company is called Janssen. And they're the uh, second biggest company, pharmaceutical company in the world, they operate all over the world, and uh, they have many, many useful products. Well, to set up the problem for you and let you think about this, and maybe get some of the younger folks in the room thinking about this for the future, because the problem's not going away. Today, because of things like Tuskegee, we have a very set system for how we move new drugs to the doctor to then get to you. And that system requires, first, you must do studies in animals. For those of you who don't think 
It's right to use animals in research. It's required by law that we do animal research first. And the reason is, no one really wants to say that the first person to see a new drug will be a human. You don't want your baby to be the first human being to be exposed to a new drug. Whatever your thoughts are about animals, people would say, better to test it on animals first, see if it's safe, then move into humans. So the first tests are always done in animals. Animals get big doses of new drugs, just trying to see what the side effects are. By the way, side note, if you're an animal with cancer, good news, we're able to cure your cancer. Unfortunately, animal studies don't always predict what happens in humans, those same drugs don't work so well in humans. So if you're a mouse, we have a lot to offer. <laughs> but to come to humans, we do it in a very careful way now, not like what happened in Tuskegee where they were just sort of throwing things at people uh, willy-nilly almost, which is why Rubin said it's not clear that it was actually research. It isn't clear that it was well organized to be research over the 40 years. But today, you would start with what's called a phase one study, first in humans. You give small doses of whatever the drug is, an anti-cancer drug, and I'm gonna be talking about one that treats something called myeloma, multiple myeloma, a horrible disease, afflicts people usually over 55. There are a lot of suffering, terrible, terrible cancer. So we would put the medicine, having tested it in animals, into humans, maybe three at a time, up until maybe a dozen humans escalating the dose a little bit, going very slowly to see what happens every time the dose bumps up to the human subjects. Those subjects, in this case, will probably be healthy volunteers. They're not gonna have the disease, and that's not because we're trying to exploit healthy people, it's because if you're sick, we can't see the side effects. So you have to have people start initially with new drugs who are relatively healthy so that if the drug is causing a problem, you can see it. Otherwise, it's gonna be disguised by the underlying disease. Everybody follow that? So the first people who try new drugs are healthy volunteers. We may pay them. We also have another name for them. Sometimes they're medical students. <laughs> but uh, they go first, hopefully, uh, with no side effects. Every once in a while, somebody gets injured or dies in a phase one study, it happens. It happened earlier this year in France. They were doing a phase one study and a person died and two other people became very, very sick in a phase one study, so they're not without risk. But the risks are low, because we're using small doses. Phase two, next step, first animals, then first in humans. Phase two is what dose do you use that gets the disease to start to do better. In cancer, we're looking to see if we can get a tumor to shrink or stop growing as fast. Those involve probably 100 people. Everybody gets the drugs, and you're probably looking at them over the course of six months to a year, and what you're trying to see is if their symptoms get better. Now, they don't have to cure them, they just have to improve. Medical research, very slow, so and very difficult, lots of the drugs don't work. Took us about 25 years to get to that hepatitis C drug that uh, we heard about earlier, which works very well, but it was a long, slow process that went through what I'm talking about. So at phase two, you see whether you can get some symptoms to change in a positive way, maybe in about 100 people. Then comes phase three, that's what you all normally think of as medical research, that's where we test the drug against a placebo or of inert drug or something that's not active. Some people get drugs, some people get nothing, and we see who does better. We also might test the new drug against the old drug if we've got one. So in some diseases we have a drug, but it doesn't work that good to get it a better one, you test it against the old one. That's where you get numbers more like 500 to 1,000 subjects, oftentimes at many medical centers, these days all around the world, being enrolled in a study. Well, I mentioned this disease, multiple myeloma. It's fatal. 
The best medicines we have for it now probably keep you alive two years, but there are new drugs coming and they're coming from something called precision medicine. Anybody heard of that? Precision medicine means being able to look at your genes or the genes that are in a cancer and find out what chemicals they make that are the cancer and use medicines to turn on your body's immune system, its natural resistance, to go after the cancer. You're tricking the body to use its own immune uh, powers to attack cancer cells. Cancer cells make characteristic uh, chemicals, and if you know what they are, we can aim at them and try to knock those chemicals out. So this is pretty cool. We can never do this. This came from being able to understand our genetics. I know all of you are well, well, well informed about genetics. <laughs> but here's an interesting fact about genetics. Where are your genes? Don't answer that. I asked a bunch of politicians at a state legislature not too long ago where their genes were, because they were going to write a law about genes. <laughs> so about half of them said they thought their genes were in their reproductive parts. These days, watching politicians, that may be true. They don't think about much. <laughs> about a quarter of them said that their genes were in their brains. That seemed to me very optimistic. <laughs> and then a quarter of them knew what you all know, but you didn't want to tell me, which is that your genes are in every cell in your body. All of your genes are everywhere. When you grow from a fetus to a grown-up, you're actually shutting genes off because they're all there when you're first an embryo, everything's on, and then you specialize an arm or a lip or a foot by shutting genes off. It happens automatically. Now, there are a few genes that turn on later in life. We know that because some of you will remember puberty. <laughs> and that happens genetically controlled. Those hormones start up and then things kick into gear later. But because we know we can get your genes out of any cell, that includes the cancer cells, the bad cells, so we're watching all the time now. This is where medical research is. Why don't some people get sick? Do they make chemicals that are naturally resistant? And the answer is yes. Some people have genetics that allow them to live a long life. I told you my father's 97. Other people die very young. That's some of it's lifestyle, smoking or drugs or drinking, but some of it is in those genes. They're doing something that are contributing to longer life. So we're starting to figure out what that is. All very exciting. Well, this multiple myeloma drug, the new one that Johnson & Johnson makes, has been in these tests that I described. Animals, phase one, phase two, it is now in phase three. It is being tested in people with multiple myeloma against people with the existing treatments. Remember, I told you those only work for about two years. So we're trying to get a better drug, but there's a problem. Here's the ethics problem. This is the one you can all think about going forward. If you, if your father, your grandfather, your grandmom is diagnosed with multiple myeloma today, the best we could do is keep her going, keep him going for two years, if we're lucky. Many people don't respond to the drugs at all. They don't get any benefit and they go downhill really fast with a lot I keep saying this their bones get brittle it's terrible disease so they may say I would like to get that drug even though the testing isn't done yet I'm not gonna live long enough for you to finish that phase three trial you're giving it to these people you're watching them for a couple of years you're seeing whether it works or not I'm gonna be dead before that's over what do I do? So, some people ask for what we call compassionate use. And it doesn't have to be for multiple myeloma, it could be for any drug. Anything that's in that path from animals to first in humans to phase two to phase three. It's an access problem. Well, guess what? If you're rich and you know the president of Johnson & Johnson, you have a better chance to get that drug than if you're wandering around as a farmer in Macon County, with all respect to Macon County. 
So who you know might help you. If you're rich, you might have an advantage in getting this drug. You can call up senators. You can talk to the mayor of Tuskegee. So you have all kinds of influence, perhaps. You can put a campaign on. Any of you seen people on social media, on the internet, begging for drugs? Well, somebody's paying for that. Somebody bought that. You hired a public relations firm. They're helping you. So this problem presents itself. And here's the ethics challenge. Johnson & Johnson shows up at my doorstep and says, you, Art, keep saying that system of who you know and who's rich is not fair. What would you do? So I'm going to tell you what we did. It's an interesting idea. It might turn out to be useful in other places, even for things like Ebola, Zika, pandemic flu, and other things where drugs or vaccines are going to be in short supply. So what we did was this. We formed a committee of 10 people, ethicists, doctors, and patients. The committee comes from all over the world because people who want the drug compassionately can't wait for the test to finish are coming from all over the world. And we did four things. First, we don't know the names of anybody. We anonymized every request that Johnson & Johnson's getting. We don't know who you are. We don't know your gender. We don't know your race. We don't know anything about you other than a number and your medical and social facts. We leveled the playing field so that everybody stands equal. Second, the same information comes in on everybody. We wrote up a standardized form so that everybody gets the same information in front of the committee. Third, we made a decision in working with the committee that we were going to try and not hurt people. So if we thought the drug would harm you, which it might if you're very, very sick, you won't get it. If you're really at the end of multiple myeloma, you won't get this drug because the drug will probably tip you over and kill you because your kidneys and other body parts can't handle it. Last, we made a decision that we would try to give the drug to people who look like they were relatively likely to respond to it, and that's done by looking at some medical information that we have on each person. So what we've done is we've set up the first ethics decision-making committee. It's based at NYU. I chair it. The members come from around the world. The requests come in. There isn't enough medicine to give to everybody. We have turned down dozens of people. But we have given it to probably hundreds of people, and we've tried to make it fair. It isn't just going to the rich. It isn't just going to people who know are well connected to other folks. It's very controversial. Somebody's got to make a decision. The old system was, who do you know and who's rich? This model says, treat everybody equal. Some people won't be able to get it because there isn't enough to give to everybody. And when I mentioned things like Zika and Ebola, remember we had for a time medicines that were in short supply because what? They weren't tested yet. They weren't approved. They were just like this multiple myeloma drug. The Ebola drugs were all experimental. People were saying, why aren't you giving it to people in Liberia? Why are you giving it to people in the US? Why do people in Spain get it, but nobody seems to get it in Sierra Leone? Well, this committee model that I'm describing to you could be a way to handle that kind of an issue if it comes up again for other diseases like Zika, or if pandemic flu came back, or we had some other emergency situation, a terrorist attack using a chemical weapon where we might not have enough medicine to go around to everybody who would get it, but more importantly, who would decide. So, well, it was an issue uh, for many years about uh, getting research to be done well, even though we know how to do research in a way that's much better than you saw with Tuskegee, much more carefully designed, that didn't make all the problems go away. Research is slow. When companies start making new drugs, they're not going to make a lot of it because until it gets approved by the FDA, they're not building a factory. They just have a small amount, and that's what they make, and that's what they use for testing. They're not going to invest in a big amount. If the thing doesn't work, they lost the money. They won't do it. So now we face this path. We want to be safe. We want to be effective. But we don't have enough drug, and some people are too sick 
to wait until the drug gets approved. Should we be compassionate to them? If we're gonna be compassionate to them, then who should decide? So there's something to think about for a, a bioethics model. I think it's a good solution to a tough problem. Um, we're writing it up. An article just appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association about this. More are coming this year. So you can read about it. I'll send all the articles to Ruben. He can have them and if you want to see them. But very interested in your feedback, your thoughts about this. I think it's one of the areas where bioethics is right out at the cutting edge because we're walking hand in hand right with the latest research, trying to do what's right, trying to be fair, trying to do better than just uh, let the better off get all the drug. But I can tell you, having sat in the committee, when you say no, when you actually sit there and you read something, you listen to the request, and we vote, it's pretty tough. It's bioethics right on the front line. Thank you. First responder, Dr. Cates. Good morning. I want to thank my good friend and colleague, Dr. Ruben Warren, for giving me yet another opportunity to discuss issues with you, issues that are of concern to all of us. But we've had enough talk this morning without commercial interruption that it's time for one commercial that I'm going to put in impromptu. Uh, while I passed my fine day here yesterday, uh, at Tuskegee University, uh, took in looking at the statue from across the road, watching the fine student body go by, feeling the warmth of the friendship on this campus. Nobody passes you without saying hello. <laughs> this is not true universally around campuses around the world or in our country, and it's a remarkable feature of this campus. You feel welcome all the time, and especially through the leadership here today. And while I was sitting there, I decided to meander down to the George Washington Carver Museum, say hello to the U.S. Public Health Park Service person on duty there, and to peruse through the bookstore, because I had brought a handful of students with me and colleagues, and I thought I might see what's in there that would be good reading for them. And I walked out with 12 books. <laughs> Duplicates, so they each get up from slavery, that should be read and understood in perspective and time. And uh, I saw another little pamphlet book, quite literally. It's yay thick. The author is Pilant, P-I-L-A-N-T. And this is the commercial message that for $2.95, you will get more than any pamphlet should be able to deliver. I spent yesterday reading that book. It's the story of George Washington Carver as told by Pallant. And as he's clear, he's not writing that to give you the biography of the man. He's writing it to give you insights into what drove the man. And it's a remarkable, insightful book, packed paragraph by paragraph. 
And one of the themes that started last night at the session we held of the late breaker, it came from the audience about the warning of education being the pathway we have to count on. And it's certainly, I think, a necessary element, but I would give a cautionary note, it'll never be enough. If people of ill will get hold of information, they can use it against you. And so we all are aware of that. But education is a highway to the right place, but it doesn't mean you're gonna get there if you don't have safeguards on that highway. Uh, the uh, booklet speaks to what was spoken of here this morning also. Because last night, Dr. Reuben Warren was careful to point out the atypical literature that one ought to familiarize themselves with, especially if you want to reach the public, not the erudite books that handfuls of us in the 360 million Americans get to read, but the majority press. And I would say in our speaker today, we have somebody who has made a dedication to being Mr. Soundbite, and I've used that phrase for him, uh, regarding bioethics, and that can sound cheesy. You know, he's looking for publicity. Well, he's not, and I'll show you some information today that tells you his philosophic underpinning for taking that path. But last night, it was pointed out through a comic book that we went through carefully uh, uh, about Captain America, that there are other routes of informing the public and that the public reads, and that this morning, the pickup of that theme I heard here was the partnership between university and town that I do think Dr. Warren has enhanced since his arrival on campus as a goal. And when you read that book about George Washington Carver, that's what that man did. He turned down offers to go to both work with Thomas Edison and to work with uh, big universities willing to pay him six figures in those days salary to stay here and do what he wanted to do. And he wanted to bring information to the local people of how to improve their lives for food and shelter out of the waste material that everyone else was throwing away and ignoring. And he was gonna show them how to get there. And he's done it then for the world as it spills over. Buy that book for two ninety eight and read it thoughtfully someplace, not in a rush, but where you're, have a quiet day, you can finish the 31 pages in that time, and you'll understand what we all would aspire to be like. And I think there's a truthful statement, but it involves working with the people to educate them by the means by which they can absorb it and will choose to absorb it, versus what somebody in university would say, that's the best erudite book on it. So I'll just, end of commercial message, okay. <laughs> on to my talk. A luminary sheds light on the legacy of the U.S. Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee. We are all in this room, myself most certainly included, and the families here even more certainly included, in a quest. What is the end result of that study? What did my relative, if you're a family member, contribute to, other than being misled and being duped. What's the goodness that came out of this? And we're all in search of that in different ways. I, from a research perspective, is my first involvement. Uh, I had received a large NIH grant to run a oral health uh, minority center, and there was a need to run studies of an oral disease that disproportionately affected African Americans. In our case, we were focused in Newark, New Jersey on oral cancer rates, 30% higher in uh, African Americans than whites, 50% higher mortality. Uh, we were focused on pediatric AIDS, at that time a newly emerging disease that had been vertically transmitted through IV drug users in that community and to their children. And these young youngsters were gonna have a short life and it was gonna be even shorter due to oral manifestations and we had to find out what that was about and how we might control that. And we did a baby bottle carrier study uh, with welfare mothers uh, trying to give them other means to achieve some quiet rather than a sweet bottle to the baby to put them to sleep and ruin their teeth as sugar sat on their teeth when they slept and the saliva shuts down and you get a very risky carrier situation. So we're back to this luminary sheds light. Next slide, please. Let's just make sure we have common ground on this definition of luminary. We all have a notion of it. Number one, 
It's a person of prominence or brilliant achievement. They do it, sir. Absolutely true whether you want to hear it out loud or not. And then also a body that gives light, sheds something on the subject matter. And he has certainly contributed to that. Next slide. Yeah. Well, so we say welcome to you, our Kaplan, to the campus. And while I agree with the title of uh, Luminary on you, I must confess that I borrowed it for having heard the introduction to Art Kaplan when he first came to NYU and gave his first public talk there in October of 2012. And when I heard that talk, uh, I have to say uh, the term that Dr. Alan Keller used, the director of the Master's Scholar Program in Humanistic Medicine at the NYU Center for Health and Human Rights, I thought he got the label right. Just a quick review of what was told to you in great detail uh, by the person running the session today. Uh, he is the director of the Division of Medical Ethics at NYU, newly created by his coming there. He has previously been, before he came, the director of the Center for Bioethics at the University of Pennsylvania. And as he referenced before that, he was the uh, founder of the Center for Bioethics at the University of Minnesota, where that 1991 conference he spoke about was held. He was before that the associate dir director at the Hastings Center. And he is the frequent bioethics consultant to government, U.S. and international, as well as to industry, as you heard through his talk on the topic he addressed today. I think his luminary credentials, rather than his academic, come out of the popular press, and I'll quote some things I found in looking it up. The New York Times headline in 2015, just this past May, eager to opine on the toughest calls in medical ethics. You know, I've heard the joke about a president of the U.S. asking for a one-handed economist as a consultant. And what he was referring to is anybody he got in on economics said, well, on one hand, this will happen. And on the other hand, this will happen. And the president's sitting there saying, well, what did I do? You're the expert. And he makes the toughest calls. I can give you an example of the controversy he's not afraid to wade into. Having known Art for a couple of years now, I would say, I don't know that Mark, uh, Art is absolutely convinced he's right. But I think he's convinced he's thought it through, come to a decision, and it's time to act when he's reflected long enough. Act. As you'll see in some quotes I'm going to give you, his belief if a bioethics conversation takes place between 10 erudite university centers only, it's a waste of everyone's time, including those bioethicists. Somebody's got to speak to the public and make this dialogue involve the public so they're informed of what's the issues, the controversies, the safeguards, the limitations on those safeguards, and maybe get some ideas from the public even how to improve it. And the headline, with the servant on to say, has made a successful career offering his opinions to physicians, institutions, and the news media, and I'll emphasize that point, the news media about doctors and how they should act. So we have a late controversy going on. Headlines in the New York papers recently over De Niro's Tribeca Film Festival and his decision to air a controversial film that was on the issue of autism and vaccines leading to autism. And the fellow who created the ruckus, and I'll use that word advisedly, out of uh, England, uh, was the person who directed the film. He was the guy who did the research. The research was done in a closet with a light bulb. He went into a closet with medical records and he changed all the records of those kids. And this was revealed by a free press. One reporter stayed on it for two years and demonstrated how his entire evidence base was fictionalized by him on paper and made it look like the events happened in the sequence they did. Complete fiction. But it's amazing when you have people and I understand the need for families facing life with an autistic child, especially the far ends of autism. Our current definition will get any kid with ants in his pants diagnosed as uh, autism. Uh, it has to be the diagnosis in my day. Uh, there are, there's a true condition here, but the fear of people and the diagnostic development of that term is underway. And many kids, I think, are now labeled that. Uh, and there'll be many subcategories and exclusion of groups in the future, I'm sure, in the labeling system. Nevertheless, 
it was fraudulent. He, the, the Lancet Journal, a distinguished British journal, withdrew the paper. He lost his license in England. And so, nevertheless, people who face this problem are grasping for some explanation. They want to know what it, what it might be due to. And they don't want to hear it was due to their gene pool. They want to have some other explanation, so they're not guilty in what they see as the pain of their child and the distortion of their own lives by managing a child like that. Very difficult. I had a relative with a similar condition uh, in my lifetime, and uh, I watched the distortion of that family. And the 50-year-old pediatrician brother, to this day, can't love his parents because he felt neglected. And he wasn't neglected. But the amount of attention to the cerebral palsy brother, my cousin, was enormous and well done by the parents, but nevertheless, he feels that deprivation. We all can understand the desperation of people. So he makes tough calls. What did he come out with recently in a New York Times uh, uh, op-ed piece? It was physicians who go public and raise questions about the safety of vaccines based on that one piece of evidence should lose their medical licenses. His opinion is they're not just anybody free to speak their mind. They have a professional responsibility. And just as they can do malpractice in medicinal treatments or surgical treatments, there's malpractice in information. And they should lose their license. Now, that's what they mean when he says he makes tough calls out there. He takes bioethics to a functional point, And you heard him talk about one he's involved in now. Not many bioethicists do that. They all seem to have two hands. They want to see the, the balance, and you have to get to a point of a call in many issues at some point when you have enough information. I'll quote further from that New York Times article. He has long been an advocate of disclosures to patients about risks and benefits of studies. Further, and has published, has pushed doctors to disclose the financial benefits they receive from drug and medical device companies. Disclosure. Doesn't mean you've been influenced by it, let the people decide. But you should disclose it so people can consider that. And at times, he has clashed with colleagues over medical questions. How can you not if you've only got one hand? That's the way I'd put it. And finally from that article, Art was quoted as having said in the 1991 Medical Ethics Symposium, the one he referenced here this morning, Informed consent is a privileged man's protection. It is not going to work as well for someone who is poor and uneducated and for whom the researcher may have prejudice and contempt. It works best for those who are educated enough to demand it. That cautionary note, no chance. <laughs> Let's be honest here. <laughs> and so we have a bioethicist who hears and sees and thinks and reflects and then speaks his mind. Publicly in the press as well as in erudite scholarly journals. And that's one of, I think, Art's unique skills. He can get into those erudite ar uh, uh, arguments with the polysyllabic words as well as anybody. Okay, with fine distinctions and meaning. But he also can boil it down to the essence and give a terse quote to a newspaper that gets right to the heart of it and makes it clear to everybody. In sum, we have an honest and involved man who by all measures speaks his mind. So then I turn now to my quest of what has this luminary said about the legacy of the US HPS syphilis study at Tuskegee? What's his view on, what light has he shed upon the legacy? The method I used to gather the facts was resorting to what I do as a researcher. I engaged a professional consultant called the biomedical librarian who knows what they're doing in the literature, not me fumbling around to hope to find a few apples. I wanted to shake the tree and get all apples to fall off. Uh, and the bio uh, biomedical uh, librarian found over 600 published articles, as was stated here earlier. I cross they cross-referenced those 600 with the term Tuskegee, and we resulted in the identification of 11 published articles 
five original manuscripts on the topic, one letter to the editor, where he had something to tell somebody who had said something, four <laughs> book reviews, and one commentary article in a newspaper. Plus, I will reference freely his 2012 talk at NYU, which was entitled, and that's why I attended, because I knew Art would have something different to say on the topic, German Medicine, Nazi Ethics, and the Legacy of the Holocaust. So on October 12th, I heard Art say, all of these experiments in the 50s and 60s, including Tuskegee, using many of the same arguments the Nazis used in their own defense, but it was not until the Tuskegee study revelations in 1972 and the outrage about the racism and poor moral foundation for that experiment that bioethics really began. Start to hear this now. We're looking for a legacy. People want to put, he said, the origins of bioethics in the Holocaust. He went on, I don't think you can do so. It was marginalized, it was denied, it was seen as the actions of crazy people. The Nuremberg Code, but it's a code for Nazis and kooks and nuts. And that's not us. And the Western world and Europe uh, and America does not have to worry about that because we aren't Nazis. We're not Mengele. We're mainstream people. We know better, except that we continue to invoke the same moral rationales in the same nasty experiments for the next 30 years after the close of World War II, after the Holocaust. So bioethics does not get its start there. Those are the words of art in that talk. I know, because I got a transcription service to transcribe his entire talk, and I read it four times. So these are details that are taken from a quiet text, not from a screen, and I'm trying to get down notes that it's flashing. If we say, he went on, bioethics begins with the Holocaust, we write off 30 years of our own bad behavior with respect to the moral argument and the abuse of human subjects. And obviously, he doesn't like that idea. And if we're going to both move forward, he said, and do better now, and also understand why we are the way we are now, and at that point I'll interject what he addressed today. What he presented today as the latest front that he's working on to try and ensure a fairness and equity to a limited access but desperately needed access to a drug to save a life has to be seen as the result of the thinking that's evolved since the revelations of Tuskegee. It could not have happened uh, 30 years ago, I don't think. He goes on, why do we have informed consent as central? It's in response to those Nazi arguments, the concept of informed consent. Why do we now have those IRBs, Institutional Review Boards, that stands for, which is a term that says nothing, if you think about it. It could have been about policy for screws and doors. I mean, it's the most meaningless term I've ever heard. Why can't it be identified internationally with some acronym that stands for use of human subjects so people can understand what it stands for? That said, that's my aside. Um, why, why do we have all those IRBs and paperwork today as a guideline to proper behavior? Well, it's because people bamboozled people in the Tuskegee study and got their consent under false pretense. And where does he take that thought? So in sum, I don't think things got good, Art says, at the end of the war. I think the Nuremberg Code is there, and I wish it were true that things got good as soon as the Nuremberg Code was put out with respect to human subjects research. I don't think they did for another 30 years, Art states, until after the Tuskegee syphilis study is made public. And I think that's a part of the history that bioethics and people interested in the ethics of medicine have to face up to. So let's go back in time then from that first talk in 2012 and find out what Art said prior to that day and take a chronological look at what our luminary has shed on the light of the Tuskegee study over the years prior to his inaugural talk when I heard him say that in, when I was in the audience. 20 years prior, in 1992, in an article called When Evil Intrudes, in the Hastings Center Report, 
He said, Americans found it hard to believe that the public health service had intentionally and systematically duped men with a disease as serious as syphilis, contagious, disabling, and life-threatening for more than 40 years. The level of outrage, he goes on to say, about the Tuskegee study was enormous. As a result of public anger over the immorality of the study in 1972, Congress created an ad hoc blue ribbon panel to review both the Tuskegee study and the adequacy of existing protections for subjects in all federally sponsored research. And he goes on to say, Congress two years later in 1974 created the Human Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects for Biomedical and Behavioral Research, which laid the foundation for the ethical requirements that govern the conduct of research on human subjects in the United States to this day, i.e. the establishment of IRBs nationwide to ensure ethical practices and human research, which rapidly then became the worldwide standards. Look at the influence spreading now around the globe, which is exactly what that 298, to come back to the commercial message, you get another one, on that little pamphlet points out while George Washington Carver focused locally, primarily, what he did, and when he did get to visit some other countries later in his life and honored, uh, had influence around the world for the same concept of take care of yourself and make sure you can use what others throw away to create what you need. You can't paint buildings, get some clay, get some water, add a few chemicals, and make paint if you can't buy paint. You can do it yourself. That was his theme. And around the world, that was well received in many countries with major poverty uh, as the majority condition. He goes on to that when Evil Intrudes uh, article to say the Tuskegee syphilis study played a crucial role in causing Americans to rethink the ethics of human experimentation. In 1993, in an article when bioethics uh, so when we, what bioethics brought to the public, another Hastings Center's report article, he said, I've come to believe, and this goes to a statement about the, the popular press, I've come to believe in doing bioethics if ultimately some of it doesn't take place in public, the road to taking place in public in this culture and the road to taking place in this culture is through the media and therefore a commitment for the uncomfortability of being pursued by reporters and answering their questions, and I'm sure he's pursued routinely on that. He went on to say stories in the Washington Post and the New York Times were the key to the beginning of the discussion about the Tuskegee and later to the establishment of the National Commission and regulations in the Belmont Report, which is what led to the IRB. Led to the IRBs. 1993, he, as a, in this report, he goes on, the early relationship between bioethics and the media was based upon scandal, Tuskegee, as well as other outrages. In 1994, in an article, Are Existing Safeguards Adequate? Many people believed it was the discovery of the cruel and barbarous experiments conducted by German scientists and doctors in the concentration camps during World War II that led to the demand for the creation of ethical standards governing human research. But that is not so, he states. Ultimately, the Nuremberg Code, he said, did not have much of an impact in the United States as there was a great deal of research conducted in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s which did not live up to the ideals and moral requirements expressed in the various codes of ethics issued post-World War II. So he is echoing himself in different settings, bringing this message out. I guess one of the things for public knowledge about this would be how do we get it out of the Hastings report and out of the other area die journals so the, the public becomes aware of this. In 1994, in that article he said, the recognition of the need for more oversight and regulation for the participating in biomedical research only arose in the mid-1970s, a consistent message. He goes on, the revelation in 1973 72, of the Tuskegee study led to a public outcry concerning the ethics of human experimentation. In 2005, in a book review, uh, by uh, a book by George Annis, Crossing Human Rights and Health Law Boundaries, American Bioethics, he says, it was the revelation of the maltreatment of subjects 
in experiments such as the Tuskegee study that produced new laws and regulations regarding the conduct of human research. In a review of a book by, uh, edited by Bonnie Steinbeck, the Oxford Handbook of Bioethics, in an article, uh, book review in Lancet, he said, a few of the founders of the field of bioethics have taken pen to hand and given their thoughts to the field's origins. That's his comment on that book. And he goes on to say, some date the discipline to 1969 and the founding of the first think tank devoted to the subject, the U.S. Hastings Center. Some lean towards 1971, citing the creation of the Joseph and Rose Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University. Some go back to the Nuremberg trial of Nazi doctors. Others see bioethics as having its birth in the Tuskegee scandal in 1972. In 2008, in that same review, he said, bioethics began in my view, that is Arthur Kaplan's review, in response to scandal and uncertainty about the abuse in the Tuskegee experiment. He then goes on in a book review in 2007 of Jane Jones's book, Bad Blood, considered to be the definitive history of the US Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee. And he opens with this line, it's shockingly, if you especially isolate it, especially with black background and white letters up here, read this. Bad blood. The Tuskegee syphilis experiment is the single most important book ever written in bioethics. And he's perplexed himself for having made that decision. Some may find this an odd choice, he said, since bad blood is not written by a bioethicist, theologian, philosopher, or physician and goes on to say, the book is not an essay on the theoretical or even applied ethics. I don't think the term bioethics appears anywhere in the book. <laughs> and then he goes on to repeat his statements about the Holocaust being misstated and the Nuremberg Code in Helsinki. I'm not going to read all those words, but it's a continuation of his line of thought. And he goes on then to say, bioethics did not flourish in the United States or anywhere else in the 1950s and 60s. And in that book review, he says, the revelation of the Tuskegee syphilis experiment in 1972 broke decades of relative silence about the dubious practices in human experimentation in the US and Europe and fueled the explosions of interest in bioethics in the US, which subsequently spilt over to the world, consistently coming back to that message. And here he comes close to his end of the review. What Jones's book also did was to go to the root cause of the Tuskegee study, racism. So you can build a highway and you can have signs on it, but you better have some cautionary controls along the way for what humans will do with information, even within guidelines. And he goes on to say this, Tuskegee and Jones's book were the true catalyst be behind the rise of bioethics. And then he comes out with one of these lines that is one of those memorable things you can quote forever. Tuskegee gave birth to modern bioethics and James H. Jones was the midwife. Uh, it's a beautiful vision of it and description. He concludes uh, in, uh, in another review he did of a book that I had the privilege of working on with Rubin, The uh, Search for the Legacy of the Study. Uh, and he opens with this statement, which I like, thank you very much, Art, but it's not up there because I liked it, it's because you said it. This is an important book. That feels good when you've worked for a couple of years on a book. Okay, this is an important book, not because it sheds new factual light upon the notorious 40-year study. The importance lies elsewhere. This is a book about a relatively unexamined aspect of this most infamous violation of research subjects in American history. What is the legacy of the Tuskegee study? And he goes on to say, it had been an article of faith that knowledge of the study cast a pall over the willingness of subsequent generations of African Americans to participate in bioethical research, uh, biomedical research. A faith convincingly challenged in a series of empirical studies summarized in the book. What seems evident, he concludes, as one reads the various essays in this volume, is that the protections that were built did not attend directly and openly to the major factor that permitted the US Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee to be undertaken, racism. So even with what came out of it, 
We have to watch vulnerables being taken advantage of by the others who see a moment of profit. And that's basically it. Still, he says, the real legacy of the U.S. Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee is how hard it remains to admit to and respond to racism, both in biomedical research and American society in general. The legacy of the U.S. Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee, he says, is that racism fueled the study, shaped the response that evolved, and continues to frame how we think about research ethics in the U.S. and increasingly in other parts of the world as more and more clinical research is outsourced to the poor and developing nations. And you can read in there a subtext, nations that don't have advanced protection systems in place, so they have more leeway, pre-1970 leeway, that they had. So what has our luminary said then about the legacy in summation? What's his view on and what light has he shed upon the legacy? Well, here I'm going to give you the bullets at the end, and this is it. So as we have seen, Art Kaplan has stated that the legacy is, take out your notepads, it'll be a test question on the final exam. <laughs> and here are the points. And think about each one. Caused America to rethink the ethics of human experimentation. America, the whole society, led to the chain of events which led to IRBs in the U.S. and around the world to protect subjects. Our current best level of safeguards developed. Not perfect, but a big improvement over what wasn't there before. He claims it established the field of bioethics, was the true catalyst for the rise of bioethics, gave birth to modern bioethics. Those are his quotes from his writings. And then finally, and this still remains a concern to deal with everywhere in the world, identified racism and other forms of prejudice against vulnerables as the core issue of bioethics in US and worldwide. The phrase locally is social justice, I believe. Sums it up nicely. And that man has made those statements over time. So as we all, for our own reasons, each of us have been in our quest for the legacy, and the quest will continue, we haven't got the final answer. You have put down benchmarks of tangible benefits that I think everyone who's been associated with this, especially family members, can take home as reassuring knowledge that there was some good that came out of this horror. And the good is articulated in the writings that you've done over the past quarter century. Thank you. First and foremost, I have to uh, share a personal statement. Dr. Kaplan, you and I have never met, but my first time uh, having the opportunity to see you and hear you was uh, when, in my former days as a full-time uh, working broadcast journalist. And with that said, I uh, thank you for all of your contributions and for the works, and particularly with the study, the uh, United States Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee. Thank you for your work. To Dr. Katz, a mentor, thank you for your work. And to the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University, Dr. Warren, who has been a mentor for me since the days of the ITC, the Interdenominational Theological Seminary, as well as throughout the days of my beginning to work in academia as a womanist communications media scholar. And with that said, I'm going to take a different perspective and look at the IRB and the syphilis study through the contextual lens of Ernest Hendon, the last surviving, <coughs> last survivor of the syphilis study. Before I continue, I'd like to, in particular, 
first and foremost acknowledge and say thank you to the family members who allowed me to be a part of their historic trip to the National Archives on yesterday at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia, <coughs> where for the first time the family members had the opportunity to actually see the medical records of their fathers, brothers, uncles, grandfathers, and great-grandfathers. As a womanist communications media scholar, narrative ethics is at the core of my scholarship. It is because of a person's agency and the treatment of that person's agency, meaning from her or his social economic perspective within the context of the race of the person that has been labeled because of societal issues as well as the ethnicity, gender, and the religion of an individual's context. It is within those components that I took a more critical look at identity and personhood and how the men have been treated and were treated in the United States Public Health Syphilis Study. In my literature review of Dr. Kaplan's work, the article that stood out for me to help me to undergird my question that I will pose for him today is the article that, is, that he wrote for the book that is titled Tuskegee Truths. And the title of his article is When Evil Intrudes. Dr. Kaplan wrote, and I did not, I did this intentionally, I want you to hear the words and not read the words. Dr. Kaplan wrote, IRB and the syphilis study through the contextual lens, excuse me, when, Kaplan revealed, and this is a quote, the history of medicine is replete with examples of research certainly considered immoral by contemporary standards that generate findings still widely accepted and cited. There are obvious forums in biomedicine such as textbooks and review articles where it makes sense for authors to include some discussion of the ethical circumstances surrounding morally dubious or blatantly immoral research. If no place is made for discussions of the morality of studies such as Tuskegee, the research community may become complacent about the importance of its responsibilities toward human subjects at the same time as the public comes to believe that good science cannot emerge from immoral research. It is in, within this context that I posit the real lived experience of Ernest Hendon. Ernest Hendon's personhood provides a moral compass for the public health community, researchers, and medical professionals to critically consider the Hippocratic Oath, which is first do no harm. But within the context of the intersectionality of race-based medicine and social economic polarizations in the American society, narrative ethics must be introduced and considered when we address the real lived experience of Ernest Hendon, his, also his biological brother Louis, two brothers in the same study, Ernest and Louis. Hendon, as well as the other brave black men in the unethical syphilis study at Tuskegee. Narrative ethics is an approach that focuses on personal identity through story, and particular events in the life story of an individual or community. These form a basis for ethical reflection and learning, both for individuals and for groups. And 
it resembles or presupposes virtual ethics. It is in this context that I take a close read of the his history of why Ernest Hendon and the men in the United States Public Health Syphilis Study became human subjects. IRB and syphilis study through the lens of Ernest Hinden, the last survivor of the syphilis study. In, on May 17, 1997, when Ernest Hinden was one of the four survivors who was able to attend the White House ceremony, he stated, everybody knows that we were mistreated. I'm glad they're seeing now that this, it will never happen again. But because of the facts that historical race-based medicine and the visual media texts exist to continue to exhibit and show us that there is a concern for why this study continues to haunt us. Let's take a quick look at the historical evidence of race-based medicine. Just very quickly, many of us ha are aware of the fact that James Marion Sims, who was a physician here in the state of Alabama, who's known as the father of modern gynecology, owned slaves in Alabama. Sims published papers in public and in public lectures revealed that he operated on healthy Negro women. But his work did not share his ethical dilemma. The women were slaves, and he did not use anesthesia when he operated on them. Within the context of visual media texts, here illustrations or photographs of the human body, in particular of bodies of people of African descent, have been used as social, economic, political propaganda. My first example I lift is a woman who is South African. She's known as Sarti Bartman. She was misled, even though she spoke four different languages in the late 1800s, she was told that she would be taken to Britain and perhaps France and would have the opportunity to speak on behalf of people, of people from the continent of Africa to let the world know that they were not na ignorant natives. But when she arrived in Britain, she became an exhibit, a human exhibit. She was placed on, and you will see from this cartoon that was depicted of her, she was literally placed on a pedestal and exhibited as a live exhibit in museums in Britain and France. The cartoon depicts the fact that, showing us that persons could literally go up and point to her body parts. And this was legal. People paid money to be allowed to walk into museums and to observe her or point out different parts of her body. Thirdly, after she died, she was later, she went on to France. She was carried on to France and her body, again, as a human being, a live human being, she was put on display in other museums in France. Due to her social economic class, she did not make money. She became a poor person and historians report that she had to become a prostitute in order to survive. It is believed that she died of a venereal disease, 
When she died, she was 25 years old. Her body parts were taken, her internal body parts, such as her brain, they were taken and placed in jars for maldehyde and put on display. In addition to, her corpse was also put on display. That happened in the late 1800s. Her body was not returned to her country until 1994, when President Nelson Mandela requested that the French government should return Sarah Bartman home. In 1958, a young African girl was placed on display, if you will, at a zoo in Belgium. It was allowed because she was a young girl of African descent. Her body was black. Years after Mr. Herndon was honored at the White House, he made a statement. He said, and you can find this on the web, my name is Ernest Hendon. I am the last remaining survivor of the Tuskegee experiment. Maybe you never heard of that. A lot of people never have. I was a nobody, and all the men involved in the experiment were nobodies. So there wasn't a lot to say about it for a lot of years. Ernest Hendon died in 2004. Within the context of the intersectionality of narrative ethics, real lived experience, and consciousness raising, I would like for you to, Dr. Kaplan, to share with us in our discussion how or expound upon race, ethnicity, class, and gender and how those social labels, if you will, impacts bioethics or the moral compass that is needed within the context of how human beings are treated. Due to the remnants of race-based medicine and social economic polarization, as well as religious discrimination, particularly within the context of black bodies. The issue that of racism and race-based medicine continues to plague the human community as well as the medical profession. Dr. Kaplan, we look forward to your response to share with us and the need of consciousness raising for bioethics in the context of race, ethnicity, class, and gender. Thank you. Well, let me see if I can kick us off here. Is that mic on? No. 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 Let's see. Yep, thank you. Well, thank you for those uh, remarks. I thought that 
multiple myeloma was one of the worst diseases causing suffering I'd ever seen, but for Ralph Katz to read everything I ever wrote, <laughs> maybe trumps that. Um, that's a unique uh, qualification. I can't wait to go home and tell my wife somebody actually read all the stuff I wrote. Um, <laughs> and I think it is true, however, kidding aside, that um, the two sets of remarks come together because one, uh, one reality is that in, in uh, looking at Tuskegee, it has had an enormous influence uh, on American medicine. It is the reason why we have the protections we do. And I'm not here to defend those protections. I spend a fair amount of time attacking them as not doing a good enough job. But they're better than what there was before Tuskegee. Tuskegee showed that racism could be pernicious and evil in America. It wasn't just Nazis uh, before that who uh, could do dehumanizing and horrible things to uh, persons, as we heard about with the exhibitions and uh, so on that were going on, and an incredibly horrible list of experiments before that on uh, African-American uh, women, uh, primarily even back to the uh, colonial times. So uh, it taught us that we have to be on guard about racism in medicine ourselves, and it certainly created the field that I work in. I uh, think it's the starting point. It, not, you can't understand anything about what we work on in bioethics today without uh, going there. Uh, that said, I'll say two other uh, quick remarks. One is, a, is that racism is not uh, over in American medicine. There was a study that came out last week that showed that African American patients get less pain relieving drugs because of racist views about pain capacities between blacks and whites. So it's still there to answer your question. It didn't go away. One way to make it better is to have more uh, minorities coming into medicine. Some schools are doing that, some aren't. NYU happens to be one that is, so I'm rather happy about that. We have 10% of the class that is African American and another equally large percentage coming in from other uh, minority groups. That obviously changes how uh, medicine is practiced and how people think. The other problem is that bioethics still remains primarily a pretty white, uh, privileged uh, area of work. We don't have enough uh, diversity in the voices that come in there, so certain issues get neglected or forgotten or just not seen because of narrow perspective. But I will say that one of the most interesting issues that's coming up now, see I can't help myself going forward here, <laughs> is what are we gonna do about defining race? Because we have all this new genetic knowledge and one of the, here, I'll, I'll give you a story and then I'll ask you a question. So the story, just to show you how interesting genetics can be, is I got a phone call not too long ago from our Huntington's disease clinic. You know, I don't know what Huntington's disease is. It's bad neurological conditions like Alzheimer's. You get it and you become demented and then you die. Usually afflicts people in their 50s. Very, very terrible, rare, thankfully, but bad disease. So the clinic calls up and they say, we have a problem. There's a guy in here, we have a new genetic test and he doesn't have the gene, he's not gonna get Huntington's disease. Well, people usually don't call me up to tell me that somebody's not gonna get a disease, and that seemed a little puzzling. So I said, well, what's the problem? And they said, well, the good news is he's not gonna get the disease. And the bad news is those aren't his parents, because we know from the genetic test that he couldn't have come from them. <laughs> so we can see all sorts of things with genetic testing. Makes for kind of interesting possibilities for daytime television. But um, we can see paternity. We can see whether you have uh, genes that appear to have come from different groups in a society that has as much coerced sexual activity 
uh, as this one did throughout history, interracial due to slavery and so on, we're going to start to see a lot more diversity in, say, the African-American population. And it will matter, because remember what I told you, precision medicine aims at genes. And you need to know what those genes are very specifically to get those cures. But that will challenge our thinking about race. Then, well, I said I'll tell you one story, but I'll tell you two. I got another request recently about an ethics issue. It had to do with a gambling casino. Ralph's right, if you do bioethics correctly, you can get involved in all kinds of places. So this one was a Native American gambling casino that's located in Connecticut. And they were having a big fight about who should get the profits from the casino. And the issue is very simple. Who is a member of the tribe? And what they wanted to know is, was there a genetic test that we could do that would establish whether you were in the tribe and then would get money from the profits from the Indian American casino or not. And a fair number of people who were taking money as Indian Americans, uh, I will say, uh, to put this politely, did not look like Indian Americans. Um, <laughs> at least, <coughs> as they like to say, phenotypically, they did not appear to be Indian American. But the answer to that question is there was a test because certain characteristic genes had been passed down through the tribe, and we did run the test. Well, I didn't run it, but the test was run, and some people were excluded from membership. So you can imagine that happening when people say, I want to get a scholarship, or I want to be eligible to go to a place. Are we going to shift to not how you look, or what you say, or how you talk, but what your genes are? And that leads to the last story I want to tell you about race and trying to struggle with what is race. Mm -hmm. So what is, and I should be careful with the provost here, but what is Hispanic? Is that a biological group? It's a pretty weird one. It runs from the Philippines to Cuba to uh, Ecuador to Spain. If you look genetically, I will promise you there's none of those groups have much in common. But we have this category we use in America called Hispanic. Mexicans, people from Tierra del Fugo, I don't know, half the world is Hispanic if you start counting in a certain way. What's that category all about? There are other people who have said to me, here's how we start every patient discussion. Uh, Ruben is a 42-year-old African-American male. I was just being kind there, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Very kind. Very kind. Maybe it's a little older. But we always begin with an identification of race. Why? What's it doing there? All studies are reported by racial categories in journals still, including Hispanic, one of our, one of my great wonder, I mean, Asian's another one, I believe that does encompass the other half of the world, so between the Hispanics and the Asians, that's just about it. But they're not real groups. They're not biological groups, they're cultural groups. Hispanic is clearly a language kind of group. We're still in the middle of racism. We report our data that way, we identify people that way, and the future of how we're starting to understand genetics isn't consistent with these categories. If we were gonna aim a medicine at somebody, we wouldn't do it because they were Hispanic. We better know a lot more about their biology and their unique personal characteristics than that label. That label tells me nothing. I can't do anything with that, but we still, use these terms, and if you want to beat up on other cultures, go to India. They probably have 50 different subcategories of people that they are well aware of as subgroups and subtypes. We don't recognize much about the differences. They watch them all the time. It's racist. It's classist. It's the history of uh, untouchable people and poor people that is on display in that society. So to answer the question, is racism gone from medicine? No, it's there every day in how people get treated. It's there every day in how we collect our research. It doesn't do much. And given the future that I started to describe to you of where precision medicine guided by specific individuals' genetics is going, it's probably time to get away from it.
I guess as a reflection on what Art has just said, and he tells his awareness as a ethicist, how he came to question the use of those terms to begin case conferences or presentation of patients or either ethical decisions. I look back on my training as an epidemiologist, and it was a given. When you thought of laying out a disease, you automatically did male-female, you did age groups, and you did races. And I think, I always thought of a question about five years into my training, what's that race thing about? And I concluded this, it was a shorthand for poor people. It was America's attempt, because we don't deal with class well at all in this We like to think of ourselves as a class in society. And we don't use, now Britain has no problem with classes. They, they have their own <laughs> class, and they have their privileges. And, and so, but we don't deal with that. Other countries deal with class well. And so we have a substitute that served similar purposes, was my conclusion. And as the picture has changed over my lifetime, a little over 42 now, I'm gonna hate it. As it's changed from when I was a teenager in the 50s, um, to the current time, when I was in high school, uh, Lincoln High School, uh, uh, a noted educational institution in New Jersey, uh, not for anything good, uh, we were in the bottom of the pile of high schools in New Jersey then, it's been taken over by the state four times to try and get it right uh, in the interim 50 years I've been gone. And uh, it's still ranked 292 out of 296 <laughs> high schools. I it was Jersey City before it was discovered, uh, as across from New York with the recent boom of the waterfront with million dollar condos. It was the old Jersey City. And in my high school, it was 60% black, 20% white, 20% Hispanic. And in that day, uh, I often share with people, my household never discussed college, and none of my playmates that I played ball with discussed college in their households. But for totally different reasons. I was going to college. College was never discussed. We only discussed what graduate field afterwards. College was a given in my household. For whatever reasons, it was. Other households and my friends, they never discussed college, but because it was out of the question. It wasn't happening. I think five kids from my graduating class went on to college that year. Three of them part-time to Newark Rutgers, delivering groceries on their bicycles to pay for it. Different worlds, caught in the neighborhood with different little enclaves. Uh, very different picture, and the assumption that black men poor. And I think, since we don't do a class, that I always assumed was what was being said. And then what, it might be nutritional issues, it might be uh, informational issues, whatever you want to associate with poor and uneducated. That has changed, if you will, either radically or not nearly enough. Take your pick of what you like as a storyline, but it's changed to where the black middle class, something like 45, 50% of African Americans are now described as being middle class. The first areas were Washington, D.C., as I recall, where the government ensured fairness of employment and opportunity, and those cities became the nucleus of the rising black middle class, and today 40, 50% at least of African Americans are versus 5%. Too slow, fast enough, neither of the two. It is what it is, I think, and it's moving in that direction. So this has become more and more meaningless, and then only remains serving as a misguide, because people are still operating off that. And you mentioned the recent issue, uh, when we had the Minority Health Center in Newark, there were, recent, there were articles coming out there about uh, people not getting the same medical care in systems where there was no payment. The VA system. And that was a perfect area to study how physicians introduce patients to treatment opportunities and options. And they found in medicine, it was just what you said occurred recently, uh, again, that they gave different opportunities to African Americans because they made certain assumptions based on that label, which probably were no longer true, and certainly that system had no influence. Everybody would get whatever they needed because the government was paying for it. But it carries over. 
We did a study in dentistry to see if it echoed, and we found out endodontic treatment versus an extraction of a decayed tooth worked the same way in the VA system. A VA researcher came in and did it and showed the same thing in dentistry. So it's a, across fields. I want to make one other comment, if I could, about a place I've landed at this age, having thought about these issues and the vulnerables, because that's the message uh, that's universal, I think, here. And I've reached the point where I'll say the word sadly, because I think of myself as a romantic in life, and I, I hope for the best and dream about the best. But I have reached the conclusion, because in high school, back in my high school days, I thought, I thought if only we could have a local colored world. This is the Brown decision coming down in education. All my classmates who were after her were thrilled with the opportunities to present. Well, not much change about their opportunity at that moment, frankly. Uh, and I often thought, the only you have a mocha colored world, you would not have the problems you face. And I got the spell of that naive notion when I got to Haiti in 1987 and began my now 30 year work down there. And when I arrived in Jeremy, the most remote town on the southern peninsula, the most remote to access in Haiti, and I realized in that town, just 10 years before, the first black republic, the only black republic in the Western Hemisphere. Got rid of the white man when they threw out Napoleon in 1804. Yep. Whites were not their problem anymore. <laughs> that they had had machete riots in the streets of the noir, the dark blacks, against the mulatto, the offspring uh, generations of the mix of the white uh, Spaniards and French that were there in the sequence. Hatred over shades and within the African American community, Spike Lee made the movie School Days, and it was about the campus he was on. It must have been Morehouse, that's where he went to school. And go look at that movie today. My memory when I saw it as an educator was nobody in that entire movie, no student can all they did, ever mention a test or an exam. This must have bothered Spike Lee to some extent about what was focus of life back in his day there. And he revealed the light skin, the, 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 the one of these versus the, uh, the jiggles. That was his description of the movie of the two groups and the color thing that is well known in the African American community, the lighter skin, the better and that holds in many societies around the world. We'll do it as a species whenever we can. We'll make it them to climb over their shoulders and be glad, please, we're not them. And we'll do it on any trait, I would say. And I have concluded that in addition to air, water and food and sex appropriation, the human is defined by the need for them. And I speak partly as one of them. Because my wife for Hanukkah about four years ago gave me the gift of the DNA sample test from National Geographic magazine. And if you haven't done that, spend your 200 bucks, save it up and do it. It'll tell you when your people left Africa, <laughs> well, your genes left Africa, not your people, your genes, and where those genes are located around the world in numbers. It's amazing what lights up on my mother's line and my father's line. And it gave me some insight into, first of all, I'm 1.4% Neanderthal. <laughs> my family Is that all? <laughs> my family said we knew that. <laughs> Okay. And then as an epidemiologist, I put some range around that number, which is a point estimate, and I asked, what's the average American's Neanderthal content? At least European German. I don't know what this average American, they don't put it that way. He said European origin, and it would be 1 to 4%. So I'm low on the factor of one's European. Maybe that's why I rose to the university professor. I was low on Neanderthal. Point being, Neanderthals ain't here today. And think about it, Europe, cold weather, tough to get food. We did that a little better, homo sapien. I say we, see, I identified with that. that makes sense. All right, and we had probably six more brain cells in our brain. And it took 10,000 years, but we got rid of them. We got the food source. It was us or them to get the food, and they're gone. There was apparently more evidence recently about interbreeding, absolutely proving this in place by genes, more evidence of it. And I would just say we have that capacity, and maybe it goes beyond that is my fear. We have the need almost to define them. And I see it reflected in so much of my world. When Russia, when USSR disappeared, 
instantly, the other big power, instantly, it was a year or two in the 90s, gone. I thought America was running us for the next 10 years. We didn't know what we were about, because my whole life, we were against communism. That's what we did. That's what got us into Vietnam. And now somebody found us more recently, defined us as the enemy, and now we're better. We have an enemy and we have a target again. The radical Islamic groups are now an enemy. And we do better with them in our being. And I think we have to own up to this, is my view on it. I'm not an anthropologist, I'm not a paleontologist, I'm certainly not a geneticist, but I have watched life from a descriptive <laughs> epidemiologist. And I'm telling you, I, I see evidence of this everywhere. We do it over and over again. And if it is going to be skin color, it's going to be neighborhood. If it's neighborhood, it's going to be whether you have freckles or not. Here's a question I pondered in high school. How come if you have a drop of black blood, you're called black? <laughs> and we have this black power thing happening right now. Would anybody in my school who was African American dare against the movement of the time to raise their hand and scream out, I'm white, I got a drop of white blood. <laughs> Why isn't a drop of black blood make you black, and yet not a drop of white blood make you white? I, I, I've been bamboozled by that one all the time. And of course, it's what line you want to associate with. I don't call myself a Neanderthal. I call myself a uh, homo sapien. And, and we have to look inside our own needs as whatever our species has as its defect. You know, this may be our advantage in the world, it may also be our defect, that we get too much time thinking about stuff that we can't understand, and we go crazy with making up stuff up here. Dogs' lives are much more straightforward, I noticed, by 50 years of raising dogs. They're straightforward with their environment, we're not. I don't know what all that says, but it's all in there somewhere. And, and, and I suggest you take some of these that appeal to you as questions and ponder them, and the young people, Bring the answer to my offspring. I won't be here. <laughs> At this time, we will take questions from the audience. Is there anyone that have a question for the keynote speaker? First of all, I think they can hear me. I have a teacher, teacher's voice. So we can hear it. Yeah. Right. They can hear? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Kahn and the cast for such an incredible exposition, and of course, Dr. Harry, too. Um, you touched so many points that it is almost impossible to ask one question, um, because uh, everything touched deep. Uh, first, does the host understand genes and what the genes are and what they do? Of course, have the advantage of understanding what is all this nonsense coming from. Uh, and I did what you did. I did my genetic analysis because, as you know, uh, being in Haiti, the Dominican Republic, which uses two-thirds of the island and Haiti, one-third, uh, Haiti was a uh, French colony, and we were a Spanish colony, and blah, blah, blah. So there's a big mix. So I want to know also. So I have 41% of West African gene pool. The 23%, I was surprised, are uh, Asian. And the rest is uh, white and whatever else came. <laughs> but it was, it was very interesting. So that's in relation to that point. I think it's very important. And I think he's right. We all should do it because you'd be amazed at how many people who consider themselves uh, more white than more black are really all the way around. And I'm sure Dr. Kaplan uh, mentioned this, and you did too, Dr. Cass, and that is the issue, even though you didn't state it, that most people miss that only 1% of the human genome, 1%, you can look it up on the internet, is what determines whether we're black, white, ugly, kinky hair, straight hair, whatever. 1%. The other 99% united us as human beings. But we always ignore the 99%. Now, because you have clearly being the beacon of getting the stuff out there. There was one item that you didn't uh, touch, neither one of you, that I would like to for you to consider, perhaps in your future writing, if it's highlighted. Because I think it's very important, but often sanitized. My concern with science, and I don't know how many of you know, I, I'll come from the bench, just a lot of research published in NASA, 600, but I published a few papers. And my concern has always been that we sanitize information. 
That's the best way that I can put it. And the sanitization is for targeted groups. So those of us who understand, like I do, I understand the gene and what it does and what it does and the DNA and the up regulation, down regulation, what controls the blue eye and the buy. It's sanitized for me and you who understand this. But the people who are being pitched the information or the misinformation that continue the issues that we have in our society, where the poor and the desperate and destitute can understand what the heck is being taught. I have two examples. One is multiple myeloma patient, Frank White, friend of mine, who passed about a year ago. And one is a dear friend of mine from Tuskegee, professor who was in the Army, uh, Vietnam, and then came back to Tuskegee, who died from uh, colon cancer. So two opposite extremes from the, from, the, from the medical point of view. And in either case, in my opinion, they, were, they fell a prey to desperations versus hope. And I think it is the responsibility of people like you who are listening to. They will not hear. If I write this down, they will not know who the heck is from. But if you write it, it will be listened to. That there must be a balance where the destitute and the desperate don't fall prey for a false hope that it is now being proclaimed by the large centers. Now remember, I spent 35 years in medical centers, big ones. My postdoctoral training was at the Texas Medical Center, and my 20 years after that was Tulane Medical Center. Pretty big places. And I'm not an MD, but I understand all this stuff. And in that case, they went to the best centers in the United States. Mayo, MD Anderson, they have money, and they can spend money. And in either case, their lifespan and the quality of life was decreased. But I don't think that no one told them the reality between the hope and the inspiration. And I would like Dr. O'Kaplan to please comment on that. Well, first of all, they should have gone to NYU. <laughs> <laughs> They'd still be here. Uh, it's a common problem when I do medical ethics. One of the things I do is I go on rounds and uh, have student groups. And we see a lot of very sick people. NYU is a, one of those places where the sick, sickest of the sick wind up. Not cancer so much, those tend to go to Sloan Kettering, but we get the other horrible diseases. And you're always doing a balancing act. You don't want to take people's hope away. And at the same time, you can look at certain people and say, we don't have anything for this. And if they're chasing cures or looking on the internet and seeing things that people say go to Mexico or get stem cells in the Dominican Republic or whatever, they're throwing money out the window because it, it, that, that stuff doesn't work. It comes up with the drugs I was talking about as they move along. The good news about the drug our committee was wrestling with is it's working. That's a drug that has efficacy. By the way, I didn't tell you this, but it got approved a month ago. So you're going to start to hear about it. It's called Daralux or Daratumumab, and it's a treatment for multiple myeloma that probably now puts 40 percent of the people who take it into remission. So that's pretty good. That's a, that's a good drug. A lot of other drugs, remember I told you about that path from animals to first in human? We don't know what they're doing. And the odds of one of those drugs that look good in animals making it to the doctor's prescription pad is about one in 500. So the failure rates are enormous. You could spend a ton of money there. So I'll tell you what I learned in dealing with one of the groups that is the most miserable for me, and that's kids who are dying. So we, I have to go see them sometimes and their families, and there's just nothing worse than a kid who's dying. Um, parents want to do anything. Literally, they would give up their lives to save their kids. They would do anything. And yet, we have these diseases that are gonna take these, some of these children, and we can't do anything about them. So what I learned was this. 
you can make hope and honesty go together a little bit if you don't promise, and the medical students to be have to listen to this, you don't promise people that you're gonna get them better or that a miracle could happen. What you promise is little hopes, like let's hope that we could get to dinner tomorrow. Let's hope that we could watch your favorite TV show two days from now. In other words, little hope is enough for families and kids. They don't need to hear about miracles. I mean, they can pray for them or hope for them, but they're probably not coming from the doctors. They're coming from spiritual sources, and that's they can deal with that in their own way. But from the medical point of view, you don't want to offer false hope. There's nothing crueler than saying, if I operate on you, and I've seen this a lot, then that'll help. And what that means is you'll live three days more. And now we just operated on you and you're gonna die worse because now you're suffering because we just cut you open. So we don't wanna do that. But the surgeon comes in, feels like they have to do something, so they offer the operation. What's the family gonna say? No. The surgeon's saying there's something there. They do it. We have a lot of colon cancer that goes out with unnecessary, or in my view, cruel operations. So you have to be realistic. You might say to somebody, I don't think we should operate. I don't think that colon cancer, it's so spread, we can't do anything about it. But here's what we could hope for. What was his favorite food? Let's use Reuben, he likes beer. <laughs> um, maybe we'll get him a sip of beer. Then the nurse freaks out, because you're not supposed to do that. I don't care. We give him a sip of beer, uh, knock him out. He has something to look forward to for the next 24 hours. So little hope, small hope, tiny hopes, small achievements. When you're very sick and you're dying, they go a long way. That's what I've learned. False hope is dangerous because it sets you up for disappointment, but it also sets you up for more suffering. And boy, we can make you suffer. We got a lot of technology that we can, we can really extend your life and make you go miserably. You wanna hear one other bit of wisdom about this? Here's what I've learned from patients over time. It's men, but women a little bit too. Nobody wants to look a coward. So you go to people and they say, I want everything. And you say, why? You're, the cancer's all over the place. We're not gonna get you better. And they say, well, I don't wanna look like I'm a coward in front of my family. I want to look like I'm a fighter. How you look, how you appear, very important to patients. It's got nothing to do with the medicine we've got. It has to do with how people want to be seen as they die. So sometimes they need to be told, you're, you're a hero. You're courageous. We, you don't have to suffer here to prove to us that you can take it or to prove to us that you're going to make up for bad things. We're at peace with all of that. So part, I'm telling this to the students, part of what I've learned is when people are asked about treatments, whether they want them, whether they're expensive or whatever, part of the reason they say yes is because they don't want to be uh, ashamed in front of their family. They don't want to look poorly as they think others might see them. So you have to address that. You have to take seriously and excuse them and make it okay. Sometimes you need a religious person to help. Sometimes the doctor can do it, but that's the other part of it. So little hopes go far, and then pay attention to what people are saying about why they want aggressive care when we know they're dying, because sometimes it's how they want to be seen. It's got nothing to do with chasing the long odds. Yeah, you had one out there. Yeah, I just wanted to just add that I think a part of this that's been missing, I think, in this part of the discussion the, the, the equity and sharing of knowledge and empowering patients to to play an active part to play an active part an equal part in their decision making I think when you share knowledge and you consider um, health literacy sharing your knowledge in a way that a patient uh, research subject can understand and make a fair and um, knowledgeable decision to participate to take a medication to have a surgery, that the empowerment portion is the part that's generally always missing when people make decisions that in the eyes of others is not really like the best decision. But you have to empower people by sharing knowledge, 
again, but not just knowledge that you know, but a knowledge in a way that it's, that it's accessible to the patient, and that's health literacy, and also in a culturally competent way. Mm -hmm. They understand that it, that it, that it matches their, their culture, their religion, the way that they see society. And when you bring all those things together, then it allows, it levels the playing field, and it allows the physician, the patient, and the family to take a, to play an active part and to really make a knowledgeable decision that they all can live with or die with. And I think that's what's really so, important. So I, I, the other panelists may want to comment on this, but I'll tell you some other little facts that, uh, again, I think are good for people who want to be nurses, doctors, dentists in the future. Health literacy is very important. It's important for a very practical reason. How many, what percent would you guess of people that get a prescription from the doctor, fill it? A hundred. Fifty. About half of prescriptions that get written don't get filled. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's access, access sometimes it's ignorance. I don't really know why I have to take this, I feel good. I don't have to get my blood pressure medicine. Feel fine. Of the people who fill their prescriptions, about half take them the way they're supposed to. Sure. And it, and it's a, it's a so literacy is crucial. And it's crucial. A, but it's literacy in combination with cultural competency. Because if I understand that if I write a prescription, because I'm a physician, if I uh -huh, write a prescription uh -huh. for my patient, and then my patient gets that prescription, and one, they don't understand why they're taking it, that's a problem. Then number two, when they say, Okay, I have to pay for my child care, I right. have to buy dinner, <laughs> I have to pay my electric bill, right. I'm going to take this medicine that I don't really understand why I'm taking, I'm not really sure how it's going to help me. Of course I'm not going to fill that prescription, right. because I'm not really aware of the, the benefits of that. So that's why it's really, it's, a, it's all in context. It's in context of how is it going to impact my life, how is it going to impact the lives of my children, or how is it going to impact how I live, how I see the world. So that's why it's not just cultural competence, it's not just health literacy, it's everything together. Right. And it's not just the cultural competence of the patient, it's of the physician, and that's why it's important when we talk about educating future physicians that we have to incorporate those elements in medical education. I absolutely agree, I absolutely agree. So, so I, I, I'm watching the time, remember I told you because I had to uh, leave town before they make me spend more money apparently? So I'm gonna uh, run out of here, but I wanted to tell you a story about health literacy. So a few years ago I had, I woke up and my, both my eyes were uh, filled with some kind of junk. I don't know what was going on. So I uh, did the right thing and I got my car and I couldn't see, so I drove <laughs> to uh, the eye doctor uh, out in the suburbs where I was. And my doctor was very nice, and he looked at my eyes and he said, I think you got an infection there, maybe from a towel or something, if you've been in a gym or something like that. And I said, yeah, and he said, well, you probably got eye infection, but before I give you the medicine, let me explain to you how your eye works, because I know you're the medical ethics guy, and you want informed consent, and you want to be my partner in this. And I said, I don't care about that, put the medicine in my eyes. <laughs> so. One of the problems of health literacy is it's better to do it when people aren't sick and start to educate them. When you get sick, and I've seen it a lot, it's true for me, I'm not interested in conversation, informed consent went out the window, all of a sudden I just want somebody to give me the medicine, make me feel better, I don't care what it is, I don't know. So we, we need to make health literacy something we do all the time, not just when you're a patient, it's hard, you know, it's harder to hear it. I, that, my little visit to the eye doctor was a nice example for me. I had no interest in literacy. I just wanted to get the goop out of my eyeballs. So maybe time for one more question, and then we can bring this one to a halt if we got one. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Molly Head, and I am a descendant. And very proud of because that's my problem. Um, I, I just have a question. Maybe this might be a little bit, I'm a little lazy. In fact, I know it is. And my husband will probably chastise me once I ask it. But um, you mentioned the drop of blood that would um, 
classify or uh, determine what race a person was in the U.S. I have heard that uh, that's a, that was a law. Yeah. So could you give us, if you know it, the reference as to where we can go and, and, and see that and read that and document that law so that we will have it? And if it's still on the books, I know it might be in some states, in some states but yeah. if it's still on the books. I don't know if it's still in the books or not. I just don't know. There was a whole system. Louisiana had laws about quatroons and doubloons and 64ths and right. yeah. 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 So there's a whole fraction system. Those laws came in in the colonial period. Uh, they were due to intermarriage. The, if you Google this, you will get a ton of these laws back. They're state laws. They tended not to be federal ones. The federal ones were put in in the 1890s to 1920s when they had that big wave of immigration from places they were also not crazy about like Italy uh, Jews were coming here so they started to reclassify not one drop but there were uh, definitions given of what it meant to be Italian for example because they didn't want to take in too many of those as part of the immigration thing anybody this is uh, I sound like Donald Trump here, but the, um, the, uh, there were these tight definitions of what an ethnic group was, too. In other societies, South Africa had a whole different system. I mentioned India. They've got their own ethnic categorizations, higher to lower. Uh, Japan, where I've been a number of times, is interesting because uh, they are acute, they're very hospitable. They love visitors and they are acutely racist in that they know who Koreans are, Chinese are, people with mixed backgrounds. Not just, as Ralph will say, it's not just the US that has its racism, but the one drop rule was absolutely uh, in law, feared, uh, fearful of uh, African, people of African uh, descent and utter, utterly racist, been around, must be 400 years, yeah. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Kate? So, Dr. Kate, one comment to Lily's, uh, Lily's uh, question. Uh, I'm going to make a suggestion about a general response to your specific question. I think the, uh, <coughs> it should be identified a librarian to work with the family group. Uh, I'm fortunate in my academic life to have married a biomedical librarian. <laughs> I can write That's a plug. Say, hey, can you do a search for me on this, and I get the most wonderful information two days later. It's a blessing for an academic to have that ease of access to information, believe me. I realize how incompetent I am if I go in, and I said before, shake a tree of information, and I'm lucky if a loose apple falls off and I'm happy, and she gets 300 barrels of apples out of that tree when she goes in. <laughs> Get yourself a knowledgeable person, tell me your lay question you're interested in, and with a dialogue with them, you will get information back to the group that is priceless. Not only where that might be registered anywhere in, in records, I've seen a listing in a South Carolina statute that listed 64 shades mm. of non-white. And this shows an incredible preoccupation. <coughs> yeah, nothing. A lot of empty time. Get a librarian for the general asking your questions like that for the group. I'm not the librarian, but it was a part of my dissertation. I'll be more than happy to uh, share information with you about it. We have a statement for Dr. Kirsten Dominic. Well, my name is Joyce Christian. I'm Lily's sister, and my father was in the Zipla uh, study here. One thing I brought home a lot of what you're saying about racism, culture, and how in each one of these areas there's always a white and a black issue. Mm -hmm. My husband and I had the opportunity to be looking up about property that his grandfather owned back in the 1920s in Clarksville, Tennessee. Very unheard of of people owning property. Well, he worked for this man who was a sharecropper. Well, he was a sharecropper and worked and planted his crops. So he earned enough money that he could get a 
quarter of a land here, a quarter of a land there, half of an uh, acre here, and so forth. And he ended up getting, what, well, 92 acres yeah. of land. Now, this was in 1920-something. So the man that had been working on his property said to him, you get off my property because if you got that much money, you don't need me. <laughs> so it's discrimination not only in who you look, what you look like, it's throughout the whole spectrum of life. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 it's, it's bad, but that's the way life is. And then the, the lady, who was really nice, who was in the archives, looking up all of these deeds and everything, she brought home something uh, that uh, was really interesting. She said, when I first moved to Clarksville, Tennessee, I saw all of these black people with blue eyes. Mm -hmm. Never seen it before. <laughs> well, you know what was happening. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, the thing is, we're always going to have that degree of racism, whether it be culturally, and I've been in all different places and traveled lots of places in the world. There's always, even in those subcultures, you have a degree of discrimination and so, so, so let me give you my last word, which is I agree with you, but when we collect data by race, when we know race doesn't make biological sense, it's time to take it out of the science. I can't get it out of society, right. but I can get it out of medicine if I try. And, and you know, you, well, maybe so, maybe so, but in the end, I think it's all going to come back because there's such a health disparity. Yeah, well, that's oh, true. That's, that's, true. That's, that's, that's very true, true. and there's that's another discussion. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you get beyond that? That's and true. I, and I think as uh, a challenge for each one of us here in this group, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to go out and touch somebody else and help them to be more health responsible, to know about what's going around in their world, and to help to make good and informed decisions. And that's always been a real pet peeve of mine, that if you know information, and it's good information, you should pass it on to somebody else. <laughs> It's nice to meet you. Thank you, Thank you, you so much for coming and spending time. Oh, great. I think they want us to step down and leave. Speaking of this issue, it's not over. Dr. Harris, Dr. Dr. Harold, Dr. Tax, the session is not over. The session is not over. It's got to be over for me. Dr. Kaplan, has, yes, Dr. Platt Kaplan has to go. That's why he had to only take that last question. But the session is not over. We still have some questions from the audience for our other speakers who remain. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Caribbean, when you have Bahamians, Jamaicans, Trinidadians, different things. 
So I had asked my instructor, I said, so what do you check when you're mixed and you have a mixture, you know what I'm saying, like um, your Bahamian and your Trinidad and you know, you have white Jamaicans, you have white Bahamians, you have different things. And my instructor, she wasn't informed of that. So I gave an example to where, you know, when I apply for jobs and you check the box, you know what I said? Sometimes I'll check this, or I'll check that, or I'll check others. And she said, well, you don't look like what you check, so that's deceiving. So I wouldn't even hire you. You know, I would just, if you look like you're black, you should check black. And um, I said, well, you have to, I didn't want to argue with her. And I said, well, you have to be more educated about what's outside of that sheet. You know, when you go to these different islands for vacations or cruises, you think you're only sitting by the, you know, the tourists. You're sitting by the natives of that land. You know, they might not be dark skin, light skin, or what you see on TV. They look like me. They look like someone else. So you have to be very careful. That person can be a pure white person, but be of something else. So like I told her, I said, well, that's not deceiving to me, because at the same time, I still got calls back. I still got calls back for those jobs, and they still talk to me and ask. They didn't ask nothing about my race. They want to know what I can do for them to be an addition to that job. So like I said, I told her, I said, it's not all about the race. And if you don't know, you can't just stick to PowerPoints and what the census says. Go out and ask questions and be more informed. When you're informed, you can perform better. You can inform. So like the lady said previously, when you know something, you pass it. So even if you're an instructor in higher power, it's still room for learning. So. Good morning. Um, Erica Williams from Howard University School of Divinity. Um, I guess, Dr. Harrell, my question would be, where was God in the midst of this? Um, and to talk about the narratives, um, what were their faith uh, journeys, or how did they sustain their, their strength in the midst of this? So I guess that would be the question, because I, I think these, as we talk about their humanity, uh, what were their just want to know more about their stories and how they overcame this during that time. I'm glad you asked the question because actually I um, shortened my presentation based on the fact that Dr. Kaplan left. But uh, first and foremost, within the context of, from a cultural perspective, spiritual, spirituality uh, and faith are critical components for the ability to live and just very simply to put up with the pain and the sufferings that people of color have to encounter. From, uh, I'd like to step back and share with you that within the context of the syphilis study, think about where the men were approached. Majority of the men were approached at their churches because the powers that be knew that the church space was a very a largely populated space where they could find the men to, uh, to approach them. In addition to, I'd like to add, on yesterday when we were at the National Archives, it was very, I found it very uh, fascinating that there were forms that were created by the United States Public Health Service and that even though after the men, some, some of the men would leave the area, had left the area of Macon County, um, they would still contact the men and if she's in here, I will address she's not. So I will not say the uh, descendant's name, but she allowed me to see <laughs> Uh, that her father had moved on to another state and he would still be located wherever he would work when, when he left Macon County. But on the form that was filled out, they wanted to know, you know, they had um, information about 
the, uh, the, the participant's health background, his physical makeup, and then also on this form, they would also ask the question, what church that he belonged to? And what was interesting from the forms that I saw, some of them, it didn't list the name of a church, it lists the denomination. So as a public theologian, God was all in it because that is the, it was the faith of the men, for some of them that we know that they believed. As one person shared with me um, yesterday, she said, oh yes, by the time he left Macon County, but with, with what's all was going on, while he was in Macon County, he didn't believe. But by the time he had all of these experiences, horrible experiences, when he left and moved to the other state, I won't say what state, she said, he knew God. My mother talked about the fact that he started to have a faith in God, and that was the only way that he was able to make it. So within a, from a theological perspective, you ask the question, where was God in all of this? Well, you have to ask, also ask the question, who is God to each of those men? Perhaps if, um, because you asked the theological question, from a womanist perspective, when we look at the story of Hagar, and the Bible says that when Hagar was in the wilderness, that she named God. So we would have to, I would like to lift up that perhaps for their belief systems, I cannot speak for the men, but I'm going to lift the fact that perhaps they decided to name God for whom they could speak to. Uh, perhaps uh, it would be best for the descendants in the room who could speak to that. But I believe that they had to have a faith system. Um, maybe some of them believed in God in order to go through what they experienced. Hi. For your question, um, I would say most of the men had. I know my father did, and they were very religious in Mexico and so forth. But before we get there, the families uh, are telling their father's story and look for a book to come out about the father's stories. And you will see how the men uh, survive. You have to remember that they didn't know anything about it for 40 years. And they had become mature. Some probably had, um, well, a lot had passed still on. And, and, and um, some had come to certain kinds of uh, maturity in their life as well as their spiritual life, as also their educational life and their, their mental life. So they probably was at a peaceful place. I know my father was. So wait for the book to come out. And ask family members, ask any one of them, how did your uh, father uh, live with this? Uh, and how did he endure it uh, once he found out? Okay. Are there any more questions? <clears throat> like to add to the young lady question. We all have to understand one thing that uh, the devil is a god too. So we all have to be careful how we carry ourselves because he always trying to take you over to the wrong side. So he's a very powerful god too. The devil. Any more questions? Thank you.
Meeting rooms, D and E, Richard, on the other side of the Kellogg. Okay, the 12th for the family. But everyone else, Bob, remains here on this side. I don't know if we get the American Indians. 